Please welcome Benjamin Scheuer. The show, I gosh, I saw it last week. It was absolutely amazing. Um, it it was like this unexpected journey that I didn't expect to go on. I didn't know. I didn't have any expect expectations going into it. Um, but it, it's extremely personal, extremely, I guess, exposed, for lack of anything else. Because you talk about some very serious things, like happy and sad. Um, but actually, happy and sad is very obvious, yes. Um, but I actually want to read something from uh, the website uh, about the show. It says, a good storyteller uses everything he has. So Benjamin Scheuer uses his guitar, actually six guitars in The Lion, a wholly original downtown musical experience that tells one man's gripping coming-of-age story. The award-winning songwriter inspires and disarms with his raw wit, emotional depth, and leads you on a rock and roll journey from boyhood to manhood through pain and healing to discover the redemptive power of music. And that says it better than, obviously, I ever could. But would you mind playing us a little song uh, to get us started at the beginning of the show. Sure, yeah, th this, is, this is how the show starts. There's no introduction. <laughs> My father has an old guitar and he plays me folk songs. My father has an old guitar and he plays me folk songs. There is nothing I want more than to play like him. He goes to the basement and builds me a cookie tin banjo. He builds me a cookie tin banjo. The strings are made of rubber bands. The strap is an old red necktie. The body is the big round lid of a metal cookie tin. And when he plays his old guitar, I play my cookie tin banjo. Play my cookie tin banjo right along with him. The more we play together, the more I fall in love with music. And I realize that my banjo is a toy that I have outgrown. I want strings of steel and something new and something real. And so he gets me a guitar to call my own. Then Dad says to me on this fine afternoon, Let's sit on the stairs, I'll teach you to tune. He hands me a pick. One that's little and black He shows me the G chord I've never looked back Now buried somewhere in a closet Is my cookie tin banjo In my arms is my guitar My greatest source of joy For the life that I have now I'm grateful to my father Who gave the gift of music to his boy It started with a simple homemade toy. So how, how old were you when you did get that Cookie Tin Banjo? About two, two and a half. Really? That yeah. young? I found a photo of it recently, of me playing, playing my Cookie Tin Banjo. It was pretty cool. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I was so excited to have it. So, um, I mean, you really learn. That's all. Like everything in the show is true story, right? There's, true story. Yeah, it's yeah. All true story. And so I'm, I'm gonna kind of give a synopsis here. Um, so you learn to play instruments from your dad, growing up, the relationship with your father. I mean, you're a complete open book, so I'm sharing this with the world. Oh yeah, right? yeah, absolutely. Like, relationship with your dad doesn't go so well. He dies young. Yeah, we get into a big fight when I was 13, and then sort of before we had reconciled, a couple of days later, he died suddenly of a brain aneurysm. And, and I totally blame myself as a kid. You know, I thought, oh, I stressed my father out and then he died, it's completely my fault. Which is kind of what you think when you're 13 because the world revolves around you when you're 13. <laughs> right. So the, the song, um, I mean, I'll talk about like the, the lyrics. It's not, what I like about your song so much is that it's not the like, traditional kind of pop uh, song lyrics. It, everything that, you, that comes out of your mouth is telling a story. Like you, you go somewhere with everything that that you sing about. Well, one of the, the, it, the storytelling, in at least in theater, is is something that I find really, really fascinating. And and the thing about storytelling in musical theater is, 
is you, if you tell a song that stops the action completely, the audience is going to be really bored. Your songs need to be the action. They need to move the story from point A to point B. And so one of the ways to do that is to put something in the present tense. Uh, don't put it in the past tense. You know, I could have said, my father had an old guitar and he played me folk songs. But audiences are smart and they know if I say, my father has an old guitar and he plays me folk songs, like, and I'm singing as a 10-year-old, they get it, as a 2-year-old, as a 5-year-old. You know, people are smart. And in musical theater, uh, th so this song is very much a musical theater song in the guise of, uh, of a folk song, in as much as the first song in any piece of theater uh, in a musical is, this is our world. Like in, in um, The Lion King, it's the circle of life. And this is the world we're in. We're in Africa, there's lions, there's elephants, great, okay. And then usually the second song in the show is the main character's I want song. You know, I just can't wait to be king. Or in The Little Mermaid, I want to be where the people are. She says, I want in the first line of the song. And so the first line of Cookie Tin Banjo is, my father has an old guitar and he plays me folk songs. Okay, so there's kid and his dad, guitars, and folk music. Great, that's our world. First line, done, check, easy. Uh, and the second line is what's usually the second song in a musical. It's the main character's I Want song. There is nothing I want more than to play like him. Okay, cool, so little Ben wants to play like dad. Off we go. Uh, and so it's, I don't like to waste words. You got, everybody's time is valuable, you know? And, and so yeah, each, each, song, each song is very much a story and I've, I, I, try, to, I try to get, things, get to things quick. Right, so, so you were playing, like I thought um, from the show that you started it later, but you're saying that you started when you were two. So like two to 13 is a long time. So you played with your father for, for like how often? Yeah, I mean, like, and your brothers too. Like every, all of you played. Yeah, I've got two two younger brothers, Adam and Simon. And Adam played the drums, and Simon, uh, who's five and a half years younger than me, just kind of played whatever we let him because he was so little. Played uh, the blocks. Yeah. Now he's a killing songwriter, uh, writing pro songs professionally. But you know, he, my dad played the bass and played the guitar, and, and Simon would also kind of play the piano and play the guitar, and we all we'd all play music together, and that's the way that my father and I got along because uh, otherwise we didn't get along so great because he was super academic. You know, he went to Harvard and then Columbia Law School, really, really bright. And, and I just, all I ever wanted to do was play music, but I kind of sucked at everything else. Because he, he knew maths. He was very good at maths, yeah, yeah, which they, they call math in England. Because yeah. your, mother, your mother's British. Yeah, mom, yeah. mom grew up in, in London and dad grew up in New York. And, uh, and mom moved to New York when she was uh, in her 20s, and she and my father met. And then when my father died, when I was 13, my mother moved our family back to England. And, uh, and I went to an all-boys boarding school uh, where I studied music and English, but they, make, they made me study math, which I really, I really sucked at. And I was a pretty angry teenager. You know, I was, uh, I was frustrated at my mom for being sad all the time. That was really nice of me, wasn't it? <laughs> and, and, it's nice to throw blame. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and, I, and I felt this responsibility that I had to look after my two little brothers, but I had no idea how I was supposed to do that. You know, I was just a, I was just a kid. And, uh, and so I got, I got back to New York as soon as I finished high school, sort of as quick as possible, and was playing, playing gig. I just, actually, I had a residency right around here. There was this club on 14th Street between 8th and 9th called Rare. It was a short-lived, really awful place, and I, used to, I played there with my rock and roll band sort of once a week, and it was, it was great fun. But then... Then, then I met a girl, which was, which was nice. Uh, and she kind of took me from feeling sad to feeling a little understood. And her name was Julia. Is this leading into a song here? Yeah, I'm going to lead into a song. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See how I did that? <laughs> and Julia and I had a great relationship uh, until we didn't. And then we stayed together for six and a half years. And... and um, Eventually, she, she told me that she, um, well, her parents had an affair, or her mother, her mother had an affair. And so Julia started to see sex as something shameful that ruins relationships. And so we had sex less and less. And I asked her, what is going on? And she didn't want to talk about it because she didn't want to betray her mother. So Julia and I talked less and less. And I started to feel ill and I was losing weight and sweating through my sheets and the, the left side of my lower back hurt when I drank alcohol. And, and then Julia told me she wants to go on a trip around the world by herself, without me. And we don't mention breaking up. And I tell her, I'll wait for you. I'll, I'll be lonely when you go. 
And she says, Ben, you're the loneliest person I know. Even if I stay, you'll be lonely. I said, where exactly are you planning on going? I'm going to the invisible cities where the pace is different than the one we know. I'm bringing only one not-so-big suitcase and I might ask you to send some things. I need a little time to explore the world alone Make some friends who've never met you Speak a language you don't know Do some dances unfamiliar in some clothes you'll never see I might lose a little you there But in your place I'll find a bit more me And off she goes And I really love her and things have gotten so bad between the two of us that if what she needs is to figure herself out away from me, then, then that's what she should do. I don't hear from her for a long time, and, and then I get an email. I met a puppy, his name is Arturo, and he rests his pointy face on my shoulder when I'm lying in bed. Here in an invisible city I met a woman and her name is Nati and she lets me share her bed with her with her and me and Arturo I need a little time to explore the world alone eat the food I've never tasted drink the wine I've never known Feel the kisses of a lover, someone sweet and dark and new. I might lose a little me there, but in my place I'll find a bit more you. And if you ask, through all these months of exploration, have you found the thing you're looking for at last? I would explain, when I arrive in each new city, I find again a past of mine I did not know I had And so I'm taking time to explore the world alone Don't expect a lot of phone calls I don't know when I'll come home It could be end of summer But more likely end of fall And maybe then you'll see me For the first time really see me and I'll cease to feel invisible at all. So Julia never comes home. And that song came out of my trying to understand why. And so I wrote it from her perspective. And I find that oftentimes writing from somebody else's perspective allows me to sort of figure out that perspective a little bit more and, and, and appreciate where they're coming from. And, and, and the same is true for writing from my own, my own perspective. You know, I was told by a songwriting teacher once uh, the best piece of its songwriting advice I'd ever gotten, which is, if you want to write a good song, write what you don't want other people to know about you. And if you want to write, write a great song, write what you don't want to know about yourself. And so writing for me is very much uh, discovery and exploration. And, and whenever my pen hesitates above the page and I'm like, oh, fuck, I absolutely cannot say that. I don't want people to know that about me. You know, they, they won't like me. They won't want to hang out with me. That's where I try to start. So if you guys want to write some tunes, uh, write down the one thing you don't want anybody to know about you and start there. And I promise you, the first time you do it, it's terrifying. But if you do it every day for three months, it'll just be your job after a while and it'll stop being that scary. And also, you'll realize that the thing you're so frightened about, if you show it to somebody else thinking they'll never speak to you again, they'll very possibly say, oh, me too. And I can't tell you how good that feels to take the thing you, you, you think is the worst thing about you and, and realize that, in fact, somebody connects to you because of that. That's pretty awesome. And that happens, that happens after your show, right? Like, you'll have, somebody, you'll have people come up to you and you'll say, like, oh, yeah, that happened to me, too. Oh, it's great. Yeah, people, the, the best compliment I can get is when somebody says, hey, man, you know, your, your story is just like my story. And then they tell me the story that has nothing to do with my story. <laughs> you know, my, my mother moved to Tennessee with my dad's canoe, and, like, I, my dad and I used to canoe together. And 
and, and, I, and I couldn't work out why this was happening. And I, and, and I think I have an answer. I think it's, it's not that the stuff that happens to us is the same. It's that we pretty much feel the same way about the stuff that does happen to us. Or like we feel, we feel alone, we feel lost, we feel loved, we feel understood you know, by other people, by ourselves. That's all, that's Especially, all. yeah, in, in a city like New York, it's like there's so many people, it's so easy to get like lost up in the shuffle of anonymity. Um, I mean, do you, do you find the process of songwriting and these people come up to you and whatnot, do, is it more therapeutic for you and for them, do you think? Like, just to talk about things that you're so afraid to, to mention publicly and then have like total acceptance. People are like, oh yeah, he's a songwriter, it's cool. Well, to, to feel that, uh, I mean, I've really tried to do, do away with guilt and shame and feeling bad for the stuff that I want and feeling bad for the stuff that has happened and worrying that people are gonna are, are not gonna like me or gonna think that I'm strange or think that I look or sound or feel weird because we all feel that way and it's just fucking tiring it's tiring to not to sort of put up a front and New York can very much be that kind of city and to be able to when I go hear songwriters who I feel tell their truth and they're not showing that how hip they are they're just showing how human they are. That's, that's what I connect to as a listener. You know, I don't need you to be the coolest person in the world, but I'd appreciate it if you were the most honest person. Because then I feel like actually we can have a conversation and I can come up to you and talk to you. And, and, and getting, to, getting to play this show for, for I guess, the, the theater I'm in right now is about 220 people. And so it's a really lovely little space. Lynn and Redgrave Theater. It's the, yeah, it's the Lynn Redgrave Theater. It's on Bleecker and Lafayette. Uh, and I, I play six shows a week there. I'm off on Mondays and Tuesdays, and then I play on... Wednesday and Thursday, and then Friday, and two shows on Saturday and a show on Sunday. And, and the only thing that really changes night to night is the audience. And, you know, different people react differently. And I, and I can pretty much only see the front row because I'm not wearing my eyeglasses. It's just like here, I can kind of I can see you all in the front row. And, and they become my cast members in as much as I, you know, I react to what they're reacting to. And, and I take the pace off of them, and I'll sing different things to different people. And then I'll, I'll chill with people afterwards. Actually, the other day, somebody was sitting in the front row just like texting and I couldn't, <laughs> but in a, in a theater and I couldn't tell if they were like really psyched and really wanted to text or that just had never been to the theater before <laughs> and didn't know that you're probably supposed to turn it off in a theater show. Right. <laughs> so we haven't gotten to like the real meat and potatoes of the show, which I guess, uh, spoiler alert, spo spoiler, he, ha he gets cancer, um, which is not a fun thing. Thanks for laughing. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So it just you, gets better and better. It gets, it gets better. The show is amazing. Um, so you get cancer, you beat cancer, you talk about all this, but I'm, I'll, we'll talk about that separately in a moment, but I want to talk about like um, doing it, let me say, six times a week, right? Yeah. So, so this, is, this is a hugely deep personal journey that you are just putting out there, you're sharing with these 220 people every night. So, I mean, do you go to the same place in your mind every night to, to dig up, I guess, for lack of anything better to say, inspiration for, for giving a fresh performance all the time? Or is it, does it become tiring, reliving this all the time? Well, it's, it's a different kind of reliving in that when I, so I was diagnosed with stage four Hodgkin's lymphoma. All these sweating through my sheets at night and, uh, and uh, my, my losing 25 pounds and the uh, pain in the left side of my lower back when I drank alcohol. Those were all symptoms of, of, uh, of cancer. And in my case, it was advanced stage cancer. And when I was ill, I had no control over my life. I had no control at all. But when I write a song, it allows me to take a bad thing and turn it into a good thing. I can go from feeling really, really alone and feel connected directly. And, and can, write, writing allows me to be an alchemist in that I can take something bad, cancer, and I can turn it into a song, which is something good. And, and so that to me is really extraordinary. I think there's really a great amount of value in telling the truth, in telling the truth in art, and telling the truth in art about bad things. I promise, tell the truth in art about bad things and you'll be doing something good. And so every night, every night it feels different because I get to control cancer. Cancer's not controlling me. You know, There's a part in the show where I sing as cancer. I take on the, the sort of character of cancer and sing as cancer. And it's totally terrifying when I first wrote it. But just like you know, if you do something enough times, it, uh, it becomes strengthening and uh, it's also it's a happy end like he lives at the end you know <laughs> he lives uh, it, it feels it feels lovely to be able to take bad things and turn turn them into good things I think it's really really a special thing about songwriting so you, you recently gave a TED talk where you discussed exactly making good things out of bad right yeah I did 
It said it was Ted X Broadway. And I I played I played a little bit of so there's a sort of bohemian rhapsody of cancer in the middle of the show and I'll I'll play a little bit of it for you guys. So so what, the way I found out I had cancer is, you know, I was losing all this weight and feeling really ill, and I was running through Grand Central Station, and I slipped and I fell. It was winter time. It was December 2010, and I spend the next day in bed, banged up and bruised. The following day, I go to my doctor, who sends me for some X-rays, and when we sit down to discuss the results of these X-rays, he looks serious. He looks scared, and he says listen, Ben, you broke your pubic bone in three places. And the reason you did is you have lytic lesions in your pelvis. I said, lytic, I don't know what that is. And he said, something's eating your bones. So what, like a good kind of an eating, like a... (laughs) (laughs) And, And they sent me for more tests. And the following day, I sat down with an oncologist. And I'm expecting him to say, listen, kid, you know, you're fine. You got holes in your bones. You got to drink more chocolate milk. But instead, he asks me, uh, have you lost 25 pounds lately? I said, yeah. He said, have you been sweating through your sheets at night? Yeah. He said, "Um, do you have pain in the left side of your lower back when you drink alcohol? Into the room and in the chair, under the flat fluorescent glare, make sure the needle is secure, hung from a bag, might flow the cure. And maybe I'm an optimist, but I don't think I'm wrong, cause they said they'll do their best and that my odds are pretty strong. Twelve treatments in, I'll go get scanned to see if it's worked the way they planned, to see if I'm finally cancer free, to see if they found a cure for me. And so I did six months of chemotherapy, which is once every two weeks, 12 doses, from February to, um, to July 2011, and then back to the office mid-July to learn if I'm actually going to die, to learn if I lose or if I win. Tests have been done, results are in. They are the final culmination of the panic and the fear that I have fought so hard to deal with this entire goddamn year. I'm gonna end up like my dad. The doctor will tell me it looks bad. It's deep in your brain, your spinal cord. Then he says, Ben, it worked you're cured. And when I learned that I was cured of cancer, I I called my mother and my brothers who had come back from England to look after me. And and then I and then I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do. Uh, and I, I learned something really interesting, which is 85% of people who are successfully cured of cancer suffer from depression. And it seems kind of head scratching at first, but the thing about it is you're working towards this extraordinary goal which is, you know, not dying. And <laughs> And, and you have this crazy medical treatment and everybody's around you and rooting for you. And then they tell you you're cured and they're like, okay, you're good. And you feel as sick as you've ever felt in your entire life because you've been punk- pumped full of poison, which is what chemotherapy is, for the last, I mean, in my case, it was six months. But everybody's like, you're good. And then they all kind of go home and they're all fine and they're not worried anymore. Uh, and so I thought, well, what, what can I do? And I started writing. I started writing about it. I started telling other people about what it was like. And, and it didn't seem at the time that maybe there was value to it and sometimes it felt stupid and sometimes it, it felt like it was kind of pointless. But I, I carried on and, and I wrote about it and, and I, it, I really taken the worst thing in my life and turned it into what has become the best thing in my life. You know, it's, I made this record of these songs and I started playing um, playing the record around little coffee shops in New York to sort of 10, 20 people at a time. I made the record with my band, Escapist Papers, and the song was called The Bridge. And the way this show came about at all is I I just didn't know what I was going to say between these songs. And so I wrote it down. 
I figured I'd memorize it. I wouldn't tell people I'd memorize what I was going to say between the songs. I'd, I'd, I wanted to be able to connect the tunes to one another better, to be able to frame each song more clearly. And so I wrote it down, and then I had a script and a score, and that's basically a musical. <laughs> and, and so I, w I was invited as a writer in residence to the, the Goodspeed Theater. It's up in Connecticut. It's a developmental theater. It's basically got a nice little college campus. You get a house and a, you know, and a, a kitchen, and, uh, and they pay you to write. And I told them I was working on a musical. It was not a musical at the time. Uh, it was just these songs. And living next door to me uh, were the guys who wrote another show called Urinetown. It was Mark Holman and Greg Kodis. Uh, these Tony Award winning writers, really ex extraordinary sort of senior members of the Broadway community. And they were developing a new show with uh, their director, Sean Daniels. And so we all became buddies. And I got invited, uh, this, this was January of 2012. And then, um, is that right? Yeah, January of, no, January of 2013. God, that's just four years ago. Three years, two years ago. Math. <laughs> math. Math. Not good at math. Math. 2013. Two years ago. All right. And I got invited to this, this other developmental theater in April 2013 in Vermont. And the guy in Vermont said, man, why don't you bring a director? You know, you need another pair of ears, another pair of eyes to help you out. And so I called the only director I you know, knew or really ever heard of, this guy, Sean Daniels. And I asked if he could recommend a young director for me to work with. Because uh, I figured Daniels himself was way, he, he was, uh, way out of my league. And he very kindly made three suggestions for three different directors. And he said, for what it's worth, kid, you know, I'll direct your show. I like your songs. You're a cool guy. And I said, well, how, how would that work? You're directing my show. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, I'm, what? What do you mean, what do I mean? How would, how would it work? How would you direct my show? He's like, oh, uh, Ben, you don't have a show, man. You have like four songs, and you're probably going to cut two of them. You know, <laughs> what, what I'd help you do is, is make the thing you, you really want to make. I'd help you outline the piece. And you know, we'll, we'll put scenes on, blue, on uh, white cards and songs on blue cards. And I'd never heard of this before. And, and we'll tell the story you want to tell. And I'll tell you when it's boring, and I'll tell you when it's stupid, and I'll tell you when it's confusing. And this seems sort of overly simplistic to me, but man, I promise you, if you get rid of boring and stupid and confusing, your thing is so much better. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> and so we, um, we took the show to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. I, I applied without telling Sean. I was like, Sean, we got a gig for the show. It's going to be great. And he said, where is it? I was like, it's in Scotland. <laughs> He's like, Scott, why would we go to Scotland? And there, there are 3,000 pieces of theater out there in the Fringe Festival. It's the biggest theater festival in the world. And, and we went, and this is, the show was still called The Bridge at that point, named after the record. And so I staged the show, one chair, three guitars, no light cues, no guitar microphone, just a vocal microphone. And, and I sat in a chair and I performed it to sort of 20 people a night. And then we won the award for best lyrics in the whole Fringe Festival. And then a theater in London called and they said, why don't you put this show up? We'd love to do that. And then a theater in New York called, the Manhattan Theater Club, uh, based at City Center, and they're, I mean, they're an amazing theater. And they sat me down, they're like, we want to do your show. Uh, we're going to put a lot of money behind it. Uh, we're going to you know, do whatever you want. Thing is, we like working with directors that, that we know. Uh, so, so that's how we're going to work. And I said, guys, I couldn't agree more. I like working with directors I know, too. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to work with Sean on this piece. And it wasn't out of some false idea of loyalty. You know? like I, he's the right guy for the job. And so we worked with him. And, and we, we put the show up in New York, and it, it sold out. And we went to London and played it there. And now I'm back at the Lynn Redgrave Theater. And it's, it's been an, a really extraordinary journey. It's been, it's been really, really cool. And it just came out of playing in these little coffee shops on Cornelia Street. You know? And did you imagine the show would be met with the critical success that, that it is? I, I thought that maybe some people would dig it. You know, I was telling, I was just trying to tell the truth as hard as I could, but I, I try not to worry about, about critics because, I mean, you know, nobody ever put up a statue to a critic. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so every night you have, you have these complete strangers there um, coming in night after night. Is, are, you, are you over the, the, I guess, impersonal aspect of playing to strangers? It's just like... Do you feel like it's, it's you and them on stage, or is it just you and you're in your head and you're telling the story, reliving it every night? Yeah, it doesn't seem impersonal at all. You know, it's, it's never, it never seems impersonal. So I really try to, every night, try to tell the story more simply and more honestly. Just like, I mean, as if, 
you know, your best friend introduced you to, you to, to some friend of his that you never met and you're hanging out with the three of you guys and you're telling a story to that person. Like, that's what it feels like. That's how I try to make it feel. I'm just kind of talking. And, and I, I do try to write songs that feel like I'm talking when I'm singing them. I'm not a singer, really. You know, I like writing for other singers, but when I, when I sing, uh, I try to make it, write the melody the way that I would talk because then it's easier for me. Like, I can't sing the big Broadway notes. I could never, I could never be in anybody else's musical, truly, because I'm not an actor and I'm not a singer. I can just kind of tell my story and play a little guitar. So the, going back to, to the cancer, um, so you worked with a, a photographer. Yeah. Um, Rhea Lerner, right? Yeah, so she took your picture once a week when you were getting chemotherapy, and yeah. it turned into this book. Yeah, I made a, I made a book... Uh, to raise money for the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. There's a foundation, a cancer charity that's very close to my heart. And Raya, Raya photographed me once a week. That was the first photo she ever took of me. I was very, very, very ill. And so on my left pectoral muscle, they put, they put a little tube, uh, an IV insertion point right there that had a tube that went up over my collarbone and under my ribs and directly into my heart. And so that's how chemotherapy works. Uh, and, I mean, I was so desperately thin, but the, the problem with New York City is when you're kind of 25 pounds underweight and gauntly skinny, is people will come up to you and be like, oh my God, you look amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so Raya came and photographed me once a week with uh, an old 70s Roloflex camera, and we documented this little journey. And, and the terrifying thing was we didn't know what the end of the story was going to be. You know, we didn't know if the last photo was going to be a, a gravestone or whatever, um, or if it was going to be kind of thumbs up, like, yeah! <laughs> And, and so I kept a journal, and Raya photographed me, and I learned a lot from, from photography about songwriting, in as much as a photo really should be about one thing. It should be very simple, and you should get rid of all the cluttering stuff that's in the way, and it should have one focal point. And the focal point isn't necessarily what the photo is about, meaning you can write a song about one thing seemingly, but it's actually about another thing. And so I learned a lot about just art in general from Raya and from her extraordinarily keen eye. I think we've, we've, there are a couple more images. Yeah, that's a pretty gruesome picture. That's, that's what chemotherapy looks like. There's a, a needle in the IV insertion point, and, uh, and what, what's in the syringe at that moment is adriamycin, which is a, a very, very potent, very mean uh, chemotherapeutic drug. And it's got sort of the consistency of jello. It's, the, it's very thick, and, uh, and it burns. You can feel it going into your heart and burning. Which is real fun, let me tell you, <laughs> real fun. And that's, uh, and then every every few months I would get what's called a PET scan, and a PET scan is how uh, cancer is tested for. So cancer is basically a problem of of growth, of reproduction. Cancer cells are cells that grow way too fast. And so when you get a PET scan, which is a cancer scan, you're injected with a radioactive glucose uh, that attaches itself to your cells, and then you go into this machine, this machine over here, and uh, the machine sees how fast the cells are reproducing. And so that's, it's, it's pretty amazing technologically. And one thing that I sort of discovered is that the first PET scan I got took about 45 minutes. The last PET scan I got took about 20 minutes just because the computer technology had improved. And when I go back now, they take about five minutes. Wow. It's, it's pretty amazing, yeah, how, how these technological advances in, in data processing, you know, affects all kinds of stuff. Well, including cancer treatment. So obviously we know the end of, of the story. He lives. Uh, he oh, lives. If you want to, by the way, that book, Between Two Spaces, you can check it out at betweentwospaces.com. And all the, all the proceeds go to the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. It's, it's a good cause. It's a very nice book. How did you get it, uh, uh, connected with her in the first place? I, I wrote to a cousin of mine uh, who, who is a photographer, and I asked her, who would be good for this project, and she recommended Raya. And I actually interviewed some photographers, and the first photographer I interviewed, you know, came over and she's like, I'm so sorry to hear what's going on. And I was like, no, 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 no. I don't need your sympathy, darling. Like, I'm just, this is an art project. You know, I've got my friends and my family, thank you, but, and I came over and I told Raya about the project, and she's like, this sounds awesome. I want to work on this. We can make something cool. And and I, I dug her, her dedication, and, 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 and that she kept impersonal in a way that ultimately allowed us to be very, very close friends. You know, she could kind of disappear and take a photo to the, por the point where I wouldn't notice. Like, I'd be going about my day, I'd get into the shower, be like floating in the bathtub. And, and we have a sort of a very fascinating relationship because the intimacy of being there 
photographing my body. And what, what we thought it was going to be was just you would take a nude portrait of me the whole time and we would just see how the body changed. But we realized that actually cancer affects life in all kinds of ways that you could never anticipate. And one of those ways was that clothing took on this really powerful meaning for me because kind of one of the only things that I could do on any given day that I had any control over at all was get dressed. And then when you go to your doctor, you're in like the green gown thing and you just, you feel you feel a, a sort of half of a person and you're dehumanized. And so clothing became control. It became armor. And, you know, that's, that still sticks with me today. So I want to I digress for a second and talk yeah. about your, your custom, wonderful custom suit here. It's a little bit lopsided, right? Yeah, it is lopsided because it's cut to play guitar in. So this right arm is cut to go like this. The left arm is cut to hold like this. And the left leg of the... the left leg of the trousers is moving around because I move this leg, but not my right leg. The guitar sits right here, so it's cut, it's cut asymmetrically. And that, that actually comes from military and hunting tailoring, you know, when you cut a jacket to hold like this. Uh, it's a sort of the, the British tailors get it right. And <laughs> they get it right. Because um, they hunt in Britain yeah, more than they, the U.S.? They, well, <laughs> um, the fellow who makes the clothes for Gun control. The, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the fellow who makes the clothes for the show is a guy called Kirk Miller, and he makes the most fabulous suits, really, really beautiful stuff. And he runs a shop called Miller's Oath, which is on Spring and Greenwich Street, just uh, down in the western part of Soho. And I mean, really, really rad, beautiful, beautiful clothing. And uh, when in the show, I wear a mic in my hair. You can't see it, but just so when I'm kind of walking around. And so I, I wear this bra that has like microphone wireless things sitting in the back of my, uh, the, behind my jacket. And so the jacket is cut and the shirt is cut to sort of accommodate it all. It's all very tricky. It's all made to look like I'm sitting in your living room, uh, but you know, with better lighting design. And six guitars. And, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Why six guitars? I mean, you've got two here. You've only played one of them so far. Yeah. Obviously we got more songs to come, but why six? I play six guitars because a lot of the songs uh, require different tunings. What I mean by different tunings is I tune the guitar to a different chord. And this, this one right here uh, is tuned C, G, D, G, C, E. And having different chords allow for different textures, different tonalities, different voicings. Uh, this, this guitar to my, to my left that I'll, I'll play in a little bit. Um, I played two songs in the show with it. This one is tuned to uh, D, A, D, D, A, D. And so you can do stuff. We were talking, we were talking earlier and you asked me about the guitar part in that, that first song, Cookie Tin Banjo, and why it was, why it was, uh, why do I have six guitars? Well, I like, I like to try and use each guitar as sort of a few different instruments at once. And the cookie tin banjo, the melody goes. And the bass line goes. And so together that sounds like. And if you do that and you put chords in between the bass and the melody, it sounds like this. And, and so I've got a, there's an electric guitar for a couple of the songs that I play as an angry teenager. It's a 72 gold top Les Paul. It's a really rad guitar. Uh, there's a guitar <laughs> that plays the role of dad's old guitar, and that's a, a 1929 Martin 018. Uh, this, this one over here is a Froggy Bottom. They're made in Vermont and they build about 100 guitars a year. And this one was, was built for me, my brothers got it for me, for, as a 30th birthday present. And it's uh, Adirondack spruce up top, uh, walnut back and sides, and I don't know if you probably can't see, but there's a little watercolor of a lion painted on the, uh, on the heel of the neck there. It's pretty awesome. So I expect everyone to be able to play because he gave you such direct lessons, right? So do you ever talk to your ex-girlfriend about any of this? Julia. Do I talk to Julia? Well, she plays a pretty prominent role in the show, and she, she did write to me when the show opened in New York uh, last summer at the Manhattan Theatre Club to wish me well and congratulations, which was, which was very cool of her. 
Uh, beyond that, no, we we don't we don't talk. What about your family? Are they still in London? They are in London. Actually, Simon, my brother Simon was in town and he came to see the Lion a couple weeks ago. The same night that Bruce Willis came to see it, and Bruce, <laughs> Bruce took me and Simon out to to get sushi at Nobu. <laughs> it was it was very cool, and he was he was telling me he's about to do a Broadway play uh, in the fall. And, and so we were just kind of talking about the intimacy of acting in a really small room. But at the end of the show, ultimately, he decided that he was going to come play the character Ben in my musical, and I, I decided I was going to go be an international action superhero. How's that working out so far? I got the boots. So, <laughs> <laughs> so your, your fingers, I mean, I just love watching you play. I'm talking much, way less than I should as a moderator. But I, I just love when your fingers just start moving at the speed of light. Like, Thank you. Did that, did that come about sort of naturally as you developed your own style, or were you ever trying to, to emulate your like the power chords and on the radio and you're like, oh, this is just really boring. Yeah, I, want, you know? I wanted to learn to play like Eddie Van Halen. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so I practiced you know, six to eight hours a day to learn to do all the, uh, all the acrobatic and crazy technical stuff with the guitar. I really wanted to see what the guitar was capable of. And it was cool to, to do all that stuff technically, but I came to the horrifying conclusion that Eddie Van Halen already plays like Eddie Van Halen and he's pretty good at it. <laughs> so if I was if I was going to figure out how to play, I better learn to just play like myself and figure out what that what that actually is. And so, I mean, in a really technical way, I, I do a lot of hybrid picking, meaning I hold a guitar pick between my thumb and my first finger. And then these other three fingers are just kind of have a mind of their own. They're doing other stuff as I'm doing it. Uh, so that's why you can play a bass and a melody and chords in between. You know, these will be the ones playing chords, these fingers. Pinky's playing the melody. My uh, pick is playing the bass, and so I like to, to get different different sounds. And, and I mean, I do do some. There's one little bit of a Van Halen-y trick in the show at the very end, uh, where you know, it, it sounds it sounds like this. It goes. And it's, it, it sounds really, really complicated. It's, I promise you it's not, actually. It's really not. But that, that's, that's a little bit of the Van, the Van Halen influence coming into the, uh, coming into my acoustic guitar playing. So do you, do you end up listening and liking more bluegrassy folk music sort of stuff? Or, or I mean, what do you listen to in your spare time? I listen to a lot of hip hop. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I listen to a lot of... I'm gonna let that sink in for a second. Uh, I mean, storytelling, is really what, what I dig. I dig a compelling story and Tupac Shakur, Marshall Mathers, uh, Outkast, Nas, yeah, Marshall Mathers is Eminem, of course. Um, uh, Biggie, no, um, Big Pun, I'm a big fan of his record, <laughs> Capital Punishment, 1996, it's a great record. Uh, yeah, and, the, and these guys, these guys are taking what, what really is uh, lyrically the most Advanced, it's the most advanced kind of lyricism. And here's the thing. So the, the best show on, the best piece of musical theater up right now, and if you haven't heard of it, you absolutely will. Paul McCartney was there last night, is Hamilton. Hamilton was written by a guy called Lin-Manuel Miranda. And it's about Alexander Hamilton. And it is a hip hop show. And, and it's not trying to sort of sque falsely squeeze hip hop onto Broadway. He is a rapper, and he is a writer, and he is one of the best guys around. And he wrote a show that's completely a game changer, just the way Leonard Bernstein thought, well, why don't we take real orchestral music and put it on stage? And he wrote West Side Story, and everyone was like, oh, okay, right. You've changed the way musical theater works. Lin-Manuel has done the same thing. And so, though my stuff, you know, it absolutely sounds folky and sounds bluegrassy, just, that's just because I play the acoustic guitar. But in actuality, to me, uh, it, Hip hop is, is much more the thing that I'm really, really interested in because these guys are doing, guys and girls are doing things that, that I aspire to do, that I would love to do. I'd love to tell these dense and complex stories. I mean, Hamilton is two hours and 45 minutes and there's not a wasted syllable in that show. Every syllable is extraordinary. I mean, go, go see it if you can. It's, it's amazing. And then I listen to, I listen to a lot of jazz. Oscar Peterson, the pianist. Um, the musicals I do dig, I dig, uh, Frank Lesser, who wrote Guys and Dolls, that's, that's absolutely my favorite show. I mean, actually, b before The Lion, the sort of pre-show music is Miles Davis and his quintet playing songs from, uh, from Guys and Dolls. And I wonder how many people have, have, caught, have caught that. But I get to, I get to war you know, warm up my dressing room to If I Were a Bell, which is 
which is a great, it's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful melody. And a wonderful, it's a wonderful lyric. So I hear, I mean, those melodies are so strong that when you just hear the melody, you hear the words too. And that's the kind of things that I'd like to write. I'd really like to write a melody that's so strong that you can hear the words, or write a lyric so strong that you automatically hear the melody. Well, you have. I, I, I after the show and during Wormos and everything this morning, I, I've had Cookie Tin Banjo in my head nonstop. Like, even if I was sitting here listening to you talk, I have Cookie Tin Banjo going through my head. After you played the other stuff, I still go back to Cookie Tin Banjo. It's a sticky uh, little melody. It is. Yeah. It is. I really like it. <laughs> so we've talked about the, the, the music, the songwriting, and the lyrics and everything. So now we've got the show. You've got music videos, too. Yeah. I'm, I'm making a record right now called Songs from the Lion. And so musical theater has been doing it backwards, right? Musical theater makes recordings of the shows as souvenirs to sell in the lobby. And this is so stupid to me. Like, if you make a record, you're not, don't make a souvenir, make a piece of art. And, and your show is not to sell your record. I mean, I'm playing to 200 people a night. What, am I going to sell, like, 150, you know, 10, maybe? Your record's to sell your show. You, you, you put out a record, you should try and sell a million copies. There's, and, and, and if you want to, you ask any 10-year-old, how do you listen to music, they'll tell you YouTube, right? And so, put out a single. Put out a, as many singles as you can and make music videos for them. And so I've made a music video for the song Cookie Tin Banjo. And it's an, it's an animated video. It has seemingly nothing to do with the show. But to me, it's the same story. Uh, and then I made a video for the song The Lion. And I made these both with, uh, with a fellow called Peter Bainton. And The Lion, it premiered at the, the Annecy Film Festival. Annecy is a ta town in the north of France, just south of Switzerland. And it's the biggest animated festival in the world. And we made, we made um, a little video for just over $10,000. And, and it was playing at Annecy alongside videos from Bjork and uh, Tom York from Radiohead had, a, had an, a video. And I mean, some really amazing artists who I really, really admire. And I was out there for a couple days and I didn't stay till, till the end. I went back to London to see my family and I got a call from Peter Bainton, the director animator. And he's like, hey man, I, I just want to let you know we won. I was like, we won, we won what? And he said, we won the best commissioned film in the festival uh, for The Lion. And I, just, I could not believe it. And so Pete and I are making a, a third video right now, third animated video. And uh, we're also making a film video, the one for the song Cure, the cancer one that I played earlier. Uh, cancer one, yay! Yeah. <laughs> and, Did you uh, film during the process too for the... No, there was no, there's no video footage, I don't believe so. Yeah. Uh, that would have been a good idea. <laughs> uh, <laughs> don't, next time! <laughs> don't relive it. Uh, and... <laughs> So we've got the lion video now. It's queued up. That's why the screen went black. Um, so we would like to have you play it, play it live while the video is going in the background. Yeah, absolutely. And be before I play, I just want to say thank you to you guys for listening to me talk and sing, and thank you very much for for having me. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Inside my gentle paws I've got some devastating claws And I'm learning what it means to really roar When all the cubs grew up and we were spread around the earth I found one day that I'd grown very sick My bones were filled with holes, my belly hung in rolls And I was bald where once my mane was thick I slept and was ashamed, I was quiet, I was tamed Then they came and stayed and helped me heal inside Though I had to learn once more to be a lion without a roar It's not the roar that makes the lion, it's the pride I always show my teeth when I am smiling I only say I love you when I'm sure Inside my gentle paws I've got some devastating claws And I'm learning what it means to really roar I always show my teeth when I am smiling I only say I love you when I'm sure Inside my gentle paws I've got some devastating claws And I'm learning what it means to really roar So we've got microphones in each aisle. Um, we've got some tickets to give away to those of you who may have questions. If you have questions, please go there now. Um, this has been absolutely wonderful. What was the process like making the, the animated video in the first place? Do you have a lot of input into that? Yeah, well, Peter, Peter's a, he, w he went to Cambridge in England and he studied architecture and oil painting because he liked making three-dimensional things in two dimensions. And eventually he realized, you know, you know what? I think actually I'm supposed to be an animator. I want to tell stories through big three-dimensional stories in two dimensions. And so uh, we had a mutual, mutual friend who connected us. Uh, and I, I'd finished recording that song, uh, The Lion, on the record, The Bridge, with Escapist Papers, my band. And, and so... I talked to, I, ca I called my friend Alex and I said, I'm looking to animate this video and there's so many words in it and I really want to do it pretty literally. Uh, do you know any animators? And he said, yeah, you should talk to my friend Peter Bainton. And so I went to meet Pete. I'd sent him the song ahead of time and he turned up at our meeting with this cardboard guy he'd made with a, uh, an X-Acto knife and a piece of cardboard. And he said, what about him as the, as the main character? And, Which just like me. Yeah, and I just kind of burst into tears and I was, <laughs> I was so moved. And... <laughs> and and Pete, Pete and I talked, it took us about nine months to make the video, and actually I met his mom uh, at, the, at the British Animation Awards, uh, where, where Pete took home the award for The Lion for uh, Public Choice for Best Music Video. And, um, and Pete's mom said, you know, I, I thought that, you know, he, Peter was at home and the kitchen floor was covered in cardboard, and I didn't know what was going on. And Pete, he, I really just let him do his thing. You know, he'd, he'd sent, he sent me an, an animatic initially, and what an animatic is, it's basically a slideshow to the song, which is kind of drawings uh, of, of how, the, how the story would work. And, and one thing that, that was really important to Peter was character. He, you know, in the very beginning of the video, there's a table with all the pictures of all the lions in the family. And what's fascinating about, about that is Peter followed every single one of those characters on a journey through the song. There's no character that doesn't have a journey in the song. And so it was very much about telling spe everybody's story very specifically and being really true to that. And there's no wasted, there's no wasted time. Similar to the way Raya, the photographer, works. Peter, Peter works the same way. And I love, man, I loved working with him. And I, re I, don't, I don't have to do a lot with Pete. I, I send him a song and I send him my ideas and I let him get on with it. And he'll come back and say, this is what we're doing. And, and it's, it's awesome. And I, I hope to, you know, we're going to make two more videos. And one day I want to make an animated feature film with him. You know, I wanna, we've made these little movies for a little bit of money. One day I want to go, you know, bother, bother Pixar and go get $10, $10 million and, and make a real movie. And I, I mean, he's going to be an extraordinary person to do that with. Right. Radish Pictures is his company. Mark my words, in 10 years, Radish Pictures, they'll, you know, they'll be fighting you guys for real estate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, question. Hey, Ben. Hey. Kevin, hey, been Kevin. a fan of yours since you played guitar in the production of Tommy that I produced at Harvard. No kidding. Good hey, man. <laughs> best, uh, best undergraduate production of Tommy guitar player ever. But, oh, thank um, you very much. That was really fun. It was awesome. Yeah. It was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like 14 years ago. Yeah. Um, 
So, like, obviously, you're a great songwriter, and 50 years ago, you might be on, like, a Stephen Sondheim path where you just write musicals, and they get, they start in Boston, and then they go to Broadway. Uh, other than Hamilton, I don't know if there are many, like, original musicals coming to Broadway. So, um, what is the, like, what, are, what does the career look like for someone who wants to be a Broadway songwriter? And um, given, like, most of the Broadway theaters right now are Disney or movie adaptations, um, what what are the plans for your career? Well, I, I, I wholeheartedly believe that making records and making theater are not in opposition to one another, that they're in fact uh, the same thing. And that if you want to write a show that you want to be successful, it, it's so th there's so many tools that can reach beyond the theater to get audiences that, that don't go to the theater. I mean, the people who come to see The Lion, yeah, it's a theater audience, but it's also kids who just hang out at Rockwood Music Hall. You know, kids <laughs> kids who dig who dig pop music or who dig folk music and 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 so I think that that if, if you're writing a show you know release your singles and if they don't work as singles rewrite them and if then they don't work then probably your show isn't gonna work in the contemporary era you know and if your if your songs are, are compelling enough that people don't even know they're from a show you know it doesn't matter people don't need to, to see the cookie tin banjo video if they like it they don't need to know it's from the lion and I mean it's it's a humble video it's only been seen 125,000 times, which is nothing in sort of big YouTube terms, but but it's way more than people who have seen the show. There's only 200 seats in the theater. So I think there's there's a real... I would advise any songwriter who's writing for the stage, and I do, uh, you know, in, in, my group of, in my group of writer friends, and it's, it's really a huge community here in New York. I mean, Sam Wilmot is an amazing songwriter. Gene Rowe is an amazing songwriter. Shana Taub is an amazing songwriter. These people are, are really putting on creative, different sounding, excellent theater. Uh, I advise them to, to write about themselves because man, if you can't write about yourself, like good luck writing about somebody else. You know, good luck telling somebody else's truth if you have a hard time telling your own. Uh, beyond that, yeah, I think thinking of different ways to do theater, I mean, uh, different venues, you know, any, anything goes. I mean, I was told that doing a one person autobiographical musical was a terrible idea and I was like, okay. You know, cool. Maybe no one will like it, but that's what I feel like doing. And I don't think there really are rules. And I think that the, the young producers, some of whom are in this room today, uh, uh, and they dig that, you know, and they'll help you make your thing. If you believe wholeheartedly and you put together a good team of people and you have a cool story to tell in a cool way, like, it'll totally work. That, that, that's what I think. And I work on YouTube now, so I'll see what I can do about getting that play count up. Great, man. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi. Hey. Um, you talked about, um, I mean, a lot of like what you've talked about has come from like, your personal ex uh, experience, your personal story. Um, you also talked about uh, the technical skills that you sought out to learn. So I was curious to, to know how much of, you know, like what you're bringing to the table as far as like the ac your actual, you know, um, the musical skills and the writing skills came from a school setting versus um, self-taught. Uh, well, I have a degree in English from Harvard, and I ha spent a lot of time reading and performing in theater and studying structure, studying three-act structure. I mean, so very, very quickly, classical three-act structure is the first act is, here is your protagonist, here is what they want. The second act is, here's why you can't have it and how they go off on their journey to try to get it. And the third act is, uh, they get it and they go home happy, that's a comedy. Uh, they don't get it and they die. That's a tragedy. And, uh, or they realize that they actually really wanted something else all along and they get that other thing and they kind of change their point of view and that's a drama. And right, this has been going on for 10,000 years. That's, you know, however long story has been told. And, and the thing about that that I've taken away is I try to incorporate that three-act structure that I've learned by studying theater and literature into every single song. Into, into each song. And so, yeah, it's, it's, very, it's very technical. You know, the, the, the lion's structure, the piece of theater's structure, is very much based on Joseph Campbell, uh, who's a 20th century American historian who codified the hero's journey. He was like, okay, what do Buddha and Jesus and Moses and Odysseus all have in common? How are their stories similar? And he kind of worked out that they all follow pretty much a similar trajectory. And so structurally, yeah, I, I really try to be very technical uh, because the, the, the closer I stay to the, the technical structuralism, the farther I can go in telling my version of that. Uh, and I've also, I've been very lucky to study at the Johnny Mercer Songwriting Workshop, which is a, uh, it's, a it's one week long. Uh, it's hosted at Northwestern University. 
and uh, they're th they're, it, here's the way it works. You apply if you're 18 to 30 years old, and you send in three tunes, and if you get in, they buy you a plane ticket, and they give you a bunch of money, and they bring you to Northwestern for a week, and you just write with three master teachers. Uh, Andrew Lippa is a fabulous writer. He's got um, Big Fish and Adam's Family and I Am Harvey Milk, the Oratorio. Uh, Craig Carnelia is another songwriter. Laurie White is another songwriter, the woman who told me if you want to write a great song, if you want to write a good song. Um, and, and I just got paid to write. It was the first time anybody had ever said, you should do that. This is a job. And there are no assignments, but you go and you write whatever you want, and then these three master teachers will say, you know, you'll play two, and they'll say, oh, you know, the second verse is actually similar to this Dylan song that maybe you haven't checked out, or did you see Stephen Sondheim's version of this song that you're doing? You know, this is a I'm, I'm sad you left song, or a I, I, I want you to love me song, or a I want to change song. I mean, it's, it's all pretty simple. We're writing the same songs again and again and again. It goes back to what we were talking about earlier. It's not that our stories are the same, but we feel the same way about it. And, and, and it was extraordinary to be able to work with these writers, these professional writers, and to meet other young writers who had similar ambitions. And so to be able to be part of a community of songwriters is one of the most valuable things because you know, we'll, we'll talk about how rhyme can be helpful, how enjambment can be helpful, how, uh, how setting up an expectation and then not fulfilling it in a song can be helpful. And, and th these are all the technical tools, and I, I very much believe that learn the technique as much as you can and then use it in support of rather than in place of what you want to say. All right, Thank you. All right, um, I have a simple question. What keeps you moving every day, like what you keep doing? And what's the motivation? Where are you getting it from? What do I get? I get a lot of motivation from the audiences. You know, I'll be, some days I wake up and I'm like, man, I do not want to go to the theater. I'm tired and it's snowing outside. I'm like, I'm comfy in bed and I don't... And then I go do a show, and I mean, I met a young kid who was 17 years old the other day who was studying, or 18, I guess, he's at NYU, and he's, a, he's studying songwriting and acting. And he said, he said, man, you're doing what I want to do. You know, that's inspiring that, you know, that I, I don't know how I could write songs about myself and it could be a job, but you're doing that. And, and that makes me want to get out of bed. And I was like, okay, well, that's, that's pretty beautiful. I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty happy guy. You know, I get to, I get to play guitar for a job <laughs> and you know and and wear red clothes it's <laughs> it, it it's it's pretty it's pretty awesome you know I love going to the recording studio I love working with Jeff Crayley who's my record producer we've worked together for years and we have the best time we get to play with microphones and play with words and play with melodies and also I get to play with some of the people I've always dreamed about working with that's one of the coolest things about like Bruce Willis like Bruce Willis. Well, in terms of the record that I'm making for the show, I'm not just making a record with guitar and vocals. You know, that's how, that's how it is in the show. But on the record, I was like, all right, well, who are the people I've always wanted to work with? And there's this one tune in the show, it's on electric guitar. It's kind of a Nine Inch Nails thing. And I was like, why don't we just hire Nine Inch Nails? They're just guys. You can call them. And so we called Josh Fries, who plays drums in Nine Inch Nails and with Sting and with Guns N' Roses. And we said, come play on the record, man. And he said, sure, you know, why not? And, and so that's incredibly exciting to me. So something that really motivates me is working with people who are better than I am. If I can keep doing that, I'll be a happy guy. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming out. That was wonderful. <laughs> so we've got, we've got uh, one more song you're going to give us to close out that's not so sad, not so cancery. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, before you start, I want to give you the plug. Everyone visit thelionmusical.com, visit Benjamin online, benjaminshoyer.com. Um, the show is great. It's phen phenomenal. I can't go on. I, I can go on and on about how wonderful it is and just how touching it is. So I'm going to get off the stage, give you your final moment. Thank Everybody, you very much. Please, thank you. Thank you for, for coming. Here's a happy song. <laughs> Hello, Jemima. It's evening in New York. I'm sitting in a doorway playing guitar. Hello, Jemima. 
In London you're asleep We said goodnight so I assume you are We work so well But the distance makes me question if it's true I want confirmation So here's what I will do I'll get into an airplane And fly across the sea Land in time for sunrise At Heathrow's Terminal 3 We'll climb into a taxi to say, where are you going, Gov? And I'll say, take me to Jemima. Take me to my love. Oh, take me to Jemima. Take me to my love. Hello, Jemima. It's morning in New York, and I can smell the winter in the air. I got your letter. You wrote to me in turquoise ink Said you bought a skirt and cut your hair And then you shared some sexy stuff you thought about all day Which makes me want to take a helicopter straight to JFK and Get into an airplane and fly across the sea Land in time for sunrise at Heathrow's Terminal 3 And climb into a taxi to say where are you going, Gov? And I'll say, take me to Jemima, take me to my love, oh, take me to Jemima, oh, take me to my love. And so, hello Jemima, I'll send this letter on its way. If I wrote a hundred pages, I would still have more to say. Cause I'd like to say hello to you in person every day. So I'll get into an airplane and fly across the sea Land in time to really start a life for you and me And climb into a taxi and say, where you going, Gov? And I'll say, take me to Jemima Take me to my love, oh Take me to Jemima Take me to my love, oh Take me to Jemima Take me to my love